How do I put them together? Okay, um, there's going to be a bit of an overlap between uh, what Kaylee was talking about and what I'm talking about. So um, after all of this, all of you are going to know a lot more about Viking Age femininity and um, ritual practitioners. And yeah, I was just I was just going to say a quick thank you to Kaylee as well, because I have actually used your um, thesis in my research as well. And it was very interesting and um, very helpful to me. Um, so I'm just going to start. Um, so in the recent years, the notion of gender, both in terms of gender roles and non-standard gender expression um, in the Viking Age has become increasingly prominent in scholarship. The heretofore widespread conceptualization of Viking Age women as passive accessory in a strictly binary world of men has been called into question, prompting debates on our perception of female agency, gender norms and social conventions in the Viking world. As this is an extremely broad, quickly developing topic that warrants the space of an entire book, I will attempt to provide a brief overview of a very specific aspect of feminine gender roles in Viking Age society, namely the apparently inherent connection between femininity and the liminality of magic and death. When discussing socially constructed, constructed concepts such as death in a historic uh, gender, sorry, in a historical period, death is not a socially constructed concept, one must be mindful of a number of pitfalls. Firstly, source criticism is vital when dealing with materials pertaining to the Viking and the Iron Age. Both written and archaeological sources are subject to error, reinterpretation, under or misrepresentation, etc., and neither can be considered an entirely faithful representation of Viking Age reality. Secondly, we must be aware that no matter how objective we attempt to be, our interpretation of past mindsets and cognitive frameworks is inherently prone to subjective fallacy due to the inevitable imprint our current society's norms and conventions leave on our perception. Matters such as gender roles and social structures are inevitably discussed with the application of modern terminology and conceptualizations, categorize, um, categorizing phenomena post factum, even when attempting to approach the contemporary mindset as closely as possible. Gender as a structure and category is essential for our understanding of social norms, identity formation, and power structures in any society. Naturally, many scholars attempted to penetrate the Viking Age mind and propose conceptual models for gender-sex relationships and the role of gender and femininity, masculinity in contemporary worldviews. For instance, Judith Butler, in her groundbreaking theory, contested the idea that sex is seen as a universal biological fact, and following this, Carol Clover proposed an alternative conceptualization of Viking Age gender, suggesting that contemporary perception of gender was more reliant on notions of honor and agency than biological sex, resulting in what Clover terms as Quatterblauder um, value system within a one sex model. According to this system, Viking Age society was preoccupied primarily with power and masculinity as the ideal characteristics that were not inherently attached to the male sex, but could be claimed and lost depending on individual qualities and agency. While Butler posits that gender is separate from sex with feminine and masculine traits being culturally constructed and not belonging exclusively to female and male bodies respectively, Clover maintains that female or fem feminine qualities effectively did not exist as a separate concept and were defined exclusively through the absence of masculinity or virtue and power under the threat of a physical force. While I agree with the notion that gender was likely not defined by the biological sex and um, normative gender roles were not constrictive and routinely traversable. I believe that the sources present um, sources present femininity as manifested in a distinct social and political territory that is defined by specifically feminine qualities and not an absence of masculine qualities. Clover's theory stems mainly from the fact that written sources tend to focus on and commend men's actions, only mentioning women when they transgress into the traditionally male territory, which they are praised, praised for. Women's value would lie only in their ability to claim masculine qualities, which merits their stories being recorded as outstanding due to their irregularity and exceptionality. However, we must remember that written sources are merely a representation of a past reality as remembered and interpreted by an overwhelmingly male Christian authorship, and the reasons to exclude women from their narrative are numerous. As pointed out by Marion Moen in her analysis of gender in the mortuary landscape, um, the apparent lack of female graves with areas 
with only one in eight graves listed as female present a landscape populated by male by men to an impossible degree, showing a demographic that could not have existed in historical reality, and thus reveals some sort of oversight or intentional omission. In her discussion of the widespread insistence of arche on arche archaeological rather than osteological sexing of Viking Age burials, she maintains that many scholars argue that archaeological sexing provides a truer image of the society and its people as it reflects their preferred self-presentation rather than biological um, sex. However, as Moen points out, and I agree, without having an insight into the relationship between gender and biological sex, we will have no access to the actual gender structures, gender fluidity and trans transgression, and many other nuances of gender expression. Additionally, a person has no direct agency in death and thus cannot affect the post-mortem treatment and pre presentation of their body. As such, while a mortuary landscape can provide an insight into gender as expressed in habitus, deducing individual identity, which could have also fluctuated in life exclusively from the grave goods someone was buried with, can be ineffective, especially considering the complexity and fluidity of Viking Age self sense of self. To illustrate this fluidity, Icelandic law, law codes suggest that a daughter can sometimes become a functional son, assuming a an entire male social role, including economic and political power, as well as clothes and other gender expression. However, if she marries, she would revert to a feminine role. This is supported by the sagas and heroic poetry, where, where Valkyrjur tend to lead a warrior life until marriage, whereupon they generally resign from their previously masculine lifestyle. It is fairly clear that women could somewhat easily transgression, uh, transition into masculine territory with, um, in some sources, it is perceived as ascending socially. One must, however, be wary of constricting all female agency to masculine actions, as earlier feminist scholarship sometimes tended to do. The purpose of gender studies should not be to make women into men, overemphasizing women's ability to partake in masculine activities and not and not to overindulge in unsubstantiated ideas of past matriarchies or a Viking age with effective gender equality. It should focus on exploring femininity and its own social power, as well as liminal spaces where lines between masculine and feminine are blurred and transgressed. While it is undoubtedly possible for a woman to act as a man, it does not mean that prescriptive gender norms or ex expectations did not exist or that gender transgressions were available to everyone in every context. It must be noted that, for example, both women functioning in masculine territory and men functioning in the feminine territory tended to come from higher social standing, indicating that gender transgressions were more permissible among the elite or in specific social or ritual situations. Shield maidens are typically daughters of kings. Men with a certain amount of magic or prophetic power are typically older, prominent members of nobility, and so on. If gender is perceived as a social construct and a performance where a role can be adopted and shed as needed, it is logical that it can be more or less fluid depending on the context. For instance, a cultic or ritual space can be seen as inherently queer due to a variety of factors. A religious or ritualistic setting in Old Norse society was generally perceived as very feminine territory, as will be evidenced later. Therefore, it can be argued that a feminine identity and gender must be adopted in order to ac access the level of liminality that is required in the ritual space. Taking on a feminine role as a man, however, comes with a social stigma of being perceived as argar or effeminate and emasculated. While men performing feminine roles in general came with an accusation of ergi, other feminine activities did not warrant the same degree of contempt as practicing seder. Seder is heavily associated with femininity due to a variety of reasons, which will be explored later, but the element of the practice that was likely considered the most perverse is the connotation of the um, sexualized ritual performances, which were likely part of Seder. It has been suggested that certain parts of the practice may have been viewed as the equivalent of sexual penetration or a passive sexual role, which would render a man ragar or argar, um, which while it is impossible to draw definite conclusions, the extreme censoring of the detail of Seder performances in the sources was likely due to its ergi nature, which would be an, a very extreme measure for something that is merely perceived as women's work. The sagas contain main, many examples of ma male Seder workers, suggested, suggesting it was fairly common for men to perform divination and other acts of sorcery. However, it is clear that Seder was not just a female-dominated territory, but potentially an exclusively feminine territory. 
as a degree of social femininity was necessarily adopted, resulting in Ergi in order to access this ritual power. Even the most powerful males will not, were not exempt from accusations of Erki attached to say their performance. For example, Odin, who in the sources is portrayed as the patriarch god, has access to liminal power and knowledge through Seder. Having been taught the craft by Freya, he can shapeshift, access the other world, and raise the dead. His knowledge and power are, however, expedited, expedited by female figures. His Seder comes from Freya. His dominion over the dead is not only shared with female goddesses, but also enacted by the female Valkyrie. His knowledge of the future comes from the female Völur he raises from the dead. Similarly, Loki, who is another non-female godly Seder practitioner, is Argur and feminine to such an extent that feminine pronouns are sometimes used to refer to them. Loki's connection to death and the feminine is reinforced by shape-shifting and giving birth as the ultimate act of womanhood, as well as fathering hell, who is presented in the sources as not the only, as not only the ruler of the underworld, but the literal personification of death. It is thus evident that say there is a feminine domain, multiple reasons can be given for this. Elder, ha Elder Hader suggests that the strongest connection to femininity stems from the association of seder and spinning, which is an inherently feminine activity. He maintains that the very etymology of seder is cord, string, or snare, which is supported by the virtually omnipresent association between seder and some kind of spinning, binding, pulling, and knotting. He further explores this through examining seder's associations with Sami Noir de Boachta and the concepts of ecstatic sorcery and shamanic mind emissaries that can manifest as balls of yarn or spindle with yarn on it as well as practice the practice of wind knots and weather manipulation in both Seder and Noir de Boachta traditions. It is also important to note that the associations between Seder and the Sami can be seen as another reasoning for the feminine or ergi nature of Seder, as it seems to be strongly connected to Sami women specifically. Similarities between Seder and shamanism and Noir de Boachta specifically are an integral and generally accepted part of Seder research with Sami no Noir de Boachta being a predominantly male craft, while Seder is a predominantly female one. It is possible that the high numbers of intermarriages between Old Norse men and Sami women attested in the sources could have facilitated increased integration of Sami ritual practice elements that would have been known to Sami women, but also not entirely unfamiliar to Old Norse populations. Possibly the magic associated with Sami women became integrated in Old Norse magic systems during the Viking Age, manifesting as one of the most powerful ritual practice complexes due it, to its additional liminality and otherness. The general profile of individuals who practice Seder and can teach it is mostly restricted to Old Norse women who are often descended from or affiliated with the Sami, Sami women and Sami men. Old Norse men who practice Seder have owned almost always inherited their craft from a Sami mother or have been taught it by a, a Sami or a woman. Another possible reason for the interconnection between Seder and femininity lies in the nature of Seder. As evidenced in Descartes' descriptions, the power of the Seder performer, Volva or otherwise, come for, directly from their connection with the spirit world and the world of the dead. Both effective and prophetic, prophetic magic require assistance from otherworldly forces that the ritual practitioner needed to have access to. A connection to and dependency on death is an inherently is an inherent feature of magic, both within and beyond the Old Norse corpus, which in simple terms, uh, magic being drawn from liminal spaces or the other world is the key element. Um, in the integral workings of phenomena such as shamanism and seder, as well as magic in general, suggest the necessity for access to the other world or often the state of death or contact with the dead. This connection can manifest in the perception of prominent female figures and their power through the seemingly inherent association between femininity and death. The connection between women and liminal states, of which death is the ultimate expression, is nearly ubiquitous. This may stem from the interlinkage between death and fecundity. A lack of fecundity and prosperity resulted in death, so they were often associated with the same domain, deities, and spirits, which were the source of both life and death. Things outside of life reside in a liminal state. As such, death is liminal, but so is pregnancy and birth and the, as they both precede life. Women's ability to create life naturally lends them a liminal quality. A woman is a veritable mediator between this world and the other. If it is a woman that guides a soul from the other world into life, it is only natural that a woman guides it from life into the other world. Someone's fate and life are closely connected to the circumstances of their birth and thus to a woman. 
The Nodnir, for instance, are routinely mentioned when a death or a birth is concerned, with one of the few cultic rituals involving them um, being Norna Graut or Norn Forage, which was related to childbirth. Similarly, the cult of the Desir revolved around both life giving and life taking. Additionally, to death warfare, which is also which also played a big part in the functionality of Seder, was also closely related to childbirth, following the idea that the person who brings one to life is responsible for their entire existence and phase, including their potentially violent death. This was also manifested in the concept of the fulge, which as something that is attached to an individual after following them into life is related to fulga and or afterbirth, and formed at birth fulga as spirits are usually seen or spoken of before someone's death serving as an omen. Through the ability to give birth, the woman thus becomes an agent of both worlds, the living and the dead, and can naturally move in liminal zones. As the function of a mediator between worlds is essential in Seder, it is logically connected to femininity as an in-between world state. I would argue that the connection between femininity and death, as well as that of death to magic knowledge and Seder, is primary, emanating in Seder as a feminine space. As such, the many features of Seder that are inherently feminine would stem from the fact that both are attached to death and liminality. The symbolism around women and death is thus truly ubiquitous. Mythological women are consistently found around or beyond bodies of water. Um, which are almost universally perceived as liminal spaces and borders between this and the other world. For example, in Sami and Finnish folklore, um, the other world is often accessed through the bottom of a lake. For instance, the Nornir dwell by Urtherbrunir, the Disir and Furgur are invoked around water, and hell resides beyond the river Gjol. Similarly, motifs of underground dwellings, which are related to death for obvious reasons, um, emerge around women, both real life and mythological. Um, Frigg's domain is Fensalir, uh, meaning hole in the fence. The goddess Saga, who's a seeress, resides in Söpvabekir, or sunken benches. Idun lives in Brunakir, um, field of wells. The Nornir once again dwell at the roots of Yggdrasil. Um, and real women, afford, uh, along with the Valkyrie in um, Daradar Riyad, um, weave or spin in the semi-subterranean Dungia. As, uh, there is little observable functional purpose for them to be semi-subterranean and filled in once discontinued. Their underground placement likely serves towards a symbolic ritual liminal space. Additionally, even the colors blue and black, which are heavily associated with death, revenge, and magic, are primarily female in the physical world, with 65% of female and only 31% of female, uh, male burials containing blue textiles. Notably, the overwhelming majority of actors in death are women, virtually all mythological beings that predict or enact death and act as psychopomps are female, the Nornir, the Disir, the Valkyrie, the Dream Women, the Völur, etc. Similarly, all deities in charge of the world of the dead, except for Odin, whose femininity has been discussed, are female. Hell presides over the majority of the dead, half of the slain warriors go to Freya, Ran takes those who die at sea, and Gefion those who die a virgin. The dead who are awakened and consulted about the future are very often female. The Voluspa Volva, who is arguably the most powerful being in the entire Old Norse corpus, as she's seemingly eternal and all-knowing, um, with her Baldur's Draumar counterpart, who's similarly resurrected by Odin from a state of double death, buried at the gates of hell. Hundla, who's awoken potentially from death by Freya, or Groa, consulted by her son on the perils of the road to the other world. Other women seem to have, in a way, possessed uh, mastered death and resurrection. Golveig, who is also referred to as a very vice, thrice dead, thrice resurrected. Sigrun or Svafa is reborn, arguably, through her own agency. The goddess Idun has the power to defy hell herself by keeping the, a keeping the Aesir ever young with her apples. As such, while there are, of course, male figures in mythology that have direct connections to death, it is still evident that death and magic are feminine territory. Power within the domains of death, liminality, and magic, while seemingly confined to a ritual space, is nevertheless actively desirable. It grants knowledge of the future, strength to enact violence and defeat enemies, and the ability to simply know things. As such, real-life ritual practitioners, while regarded with caution and sometimes contempt due to their otherness, were still sought after and treated with extreme respect. For a long time, Viking Age women have been denied a space in societal power structures and banished to the peripheries in scholarship, confined to the ritual space which was conceived of as a hidden role, removed from the public sphere of political influence. 
I find it evident, however, that while the domain of ritual and religious power is in fact dominated by women and accessible exclusively by adopting femininity, agency in this area is inextricably linked to general social agency and power, desirable enough for men to be willing to risk accusations of ergi and adopt femininity to access them. While men may generally dominate the realm of the living, the power from beyond the mortal realm is inaccessible to them. As such, women and agents of femininity through their liminality will the power that, while rendering them somewhat other and therefore both feared and respected, is necessary for maintaining the balance of life and death, and is thus not more and not less than the power available to men. Femininity and masculinity thus seem to both possess specific areas of agency and influence that are normative but not entirely restrictive, making gender and gender roles fairly defined yet traversable. Femininity and its liminality thus needs to be explored not as a lamentable absence of masculinity and true social and political power, but for its unique qualities that form a necessary part of gender definition and expression, social structure, and power dynamics in a society. Thank you.